Hello and welcome to Good Words, the Geek Embassy's video series on how to write well. I'm your host, Regina McMenemy, and I'm here with Evan Graham. Hello. <laughs> and we are continuing our series about characters. Uh, and today we're going to talk about round and flat and dynamic and static characters. Um, and these are some pretty academic terms. Like, I don't think we generally, when we're talking in the Hangouts about shows that we enjoy or books and stories that we've read, I don't think we throw these terms around very often, but they're kind of things that we intuitively understand about characters and about characters that we like. Mm, and I think everybody kind of, you, you see them in pretty much every form of fiction to one degree or another. And I think the, the one thing that kind of stands out that makes the difference between a round and a flat character is how close they are to being a real person. Right, like how authentic do you feel their depiction is? And being um, round and dynamic is generally more real, or we feel it's more real, it's more authentic. Yeah, they, they feel more like people who have like multiple sides to their personality, who have a history attached to them that they've experienced their own portion of life on in their own ways and they have many reasons for doing everything they do they don't just have one specific motivation for everything it's it's many different things and uh, whereas a flat character what you see is what you get like there right. isn't anything going on behind the scenes there right there's no change there's just who they are they stay the ex exactly the same through the entire story um, there's no evolution of their character, which is one of the things that we don't really um, recognize unless you're somebody who's start who's you know studied it. It's not something that you kind of think about or you might not think about. Um, but watching people change is pretty or or experiencing the change of the characters is pretty important to a story feeling interesting. Mm -hmm. And there's not necessarily anything bad with flat characters in the proper context. Like if you have a, a story, like a fantasy story where your main character like walks into a village and has to buy a sword from a blacksmith and goes to the blacksmith, tips him five gold, gets his sword sharpened and then leaves, that blacksmith doesn't have to have an entire story arc. He's only there for five minutes. <laughs> right. It's he okay for him to be kind of he flat. fulfills He's, his meaning and his purpose. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you can still have interesting characters that are flat. Like he could be, he could have like this crazy accent, or he could be like squinty with one eye and, and talk like a pirate or something like that. He could be cool. He could be interesting, but he doesn't have to have an overall story arc, and he probably even shouldn't, because if he does, he might be distracting from your main characters and your story as a whole. Like everything should serve the purpose of the overall story. If it doesn't, it's a distraction and it causes problems. Right, exactly. And we, we can't have, that's one of the things like, I guess we haven't really talked about. You can't have too many characters having plot lines. <laughs> You can have lots. You can have lots, and and I don't know. I would, you know, even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking of Game of Thrones as the first example that kind of comes mm. to mind, and that is actually one of the problems I have with Game of Thrones is keeping track of so many characters, so many different plots, so many different places, so many names. <laughs> yeah. Well, to an extent, I think that has to do with the medium in which the story is being told and the kind of story being told. I think some stories work better with lots of main characters and some work less well with them. Like yeah. TV shows in particular can do very well with having large casts because the story is told over a much longer period of time. You have much more time to spend with these characters. Like take any given Star Trek series, you've got an entire bridge crew of main characters and even some side characters you only see every once in a while, but all of them will get their own episode and all of them will have interactions with the other characters in the show. So you have time to flesh them out. If you're doing a book that's just a single novel or a single movie or something like that, then you don't have as much time to spread it out among multiple characters. And also 
if you want to tell the main, if you want the story to revolve around one specific character or maybe two specific characters or three, then you don't want to diffuse attention away from them too much. Right. You can still build other characters and you should, as you go on, have other characters that are dynamic that are not your main characters, but the emphasis of the overall story should be on them and it should serve them. Yeah, I think that's one of the tricky things with certain series that have more of an ensemble sort of feel to them, uh, with certain movies that are ensemble movies. I know people who hate ensemble movies, like just hate them. And I'm thinking um, of, um, oh God, like Love Actually, or um, other stories that are, you only see snippets. Like you see every every main, there's like four or five or six different plots. And sometimes they interconnect with each other, mm -hmm. um, but you know, they really have their sort of own separate stories and you only see like the total time of any one of those stories is like 20 to 25 minutes. And some people really hate that. And I wonder if that is because in order to have truly dynamic or round characters, you need to have them spend a little bit more time in the development stage. Mm -hmm. And they have to have a reason to be there too, which is another thing that's kind of tricky. Like when I, I tend to enjoy ensemble stories. Yeah, me too. I, I love I love seeing snippets, but I feel like it kind of, I think because I'm a writer, I'm more likely to fill in what's not there with yeah. some of the stories. And I think that some people don't have that sort of creative bend to how they read things. So I think that that might be part of it. Well, and when you have stories that focus on one specific character or two specific characters, they kind of have to be a jack of all trades. Like they have to have like aspects of them have to be very, very well-rounded because they fulfill a, multiple different roles over the course of the story. If you have an ensemble story, you can specialize people. Like I'm thinking of like a heist movie, like the Italian job or Ocean's oh, right, Eleven or yeah. something like that, where every single main character is there because specifically because they have a skill that's needed for the task, the ultimate goal of breaking into this safe and stealing the money and getting away with it or whatever. Like they all have a story driven reason to be there that they're the only character who can fulfill this role. So they have to be there. Right. And they don't yeah. all necessarily contribute to the same degree. You usually have like the front man who's like running yeah, everything or who's like in the field doing the, the version or whatever. Like you usually kind of still have a star, but it's much less like it's much more subtle in terms of the other characters in the ensemble still have a lot of time to be there. And you can kind of explore more interesting kinds of characters than you could. Like you can't really have a very interesting, well, you can have any kind of story, but it's it's harder to tell an interesting story about a hacker who all they do is hack stuff. Right. But if you have a hacker on your heist team, then you can have a really interesting hacker type character that you couldn't necessarily have as your main character. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, two TV shows are coming to mind as you're talking about this, and that's um, Leverage, which is like the heist, you know, the Robin Hood heist, right? Because they were doing good for people. Um, but it had the same and they even like label everybody in the show like one character's the heavy and one's the hacker and one's the thief and one's the mastermind so you, the, like you literally have them in their categories and then uh con con woman i think was the other one and then i'm also thinking of um, eureka mm -hmm. um, with having like so many different characters um that kind of come and go and have different um, plot lines and different you know specific episodes to them but all interact kind of together with like whatever big story. And that I think sort of more or less shows up in any kind of ensemble storytelling. You've always got people who sort of specialize. It's kind of become a, it's kind of diffused into our social expectation that everybody in an ensemble cast has a specific reason to be there. And if they don't, then it's not necessarily good. Like it's why right. do we have this right. many characters? Yeah. Like you can have, like I'm thinking like Lord of the Rings again is another go-to example where you've got the Fellowship of the Ring. They're all there for specific reasons, some for plot-based reasons and some for like the audience's benefit. Like there's no real reason to have Merry and Pippin be there in terms right. of the plot. Comedic they don't... relief. Yeah. But for the audience, it helps because they're people we can kind of personally relate to. Yeah. But you've got like Aragorn has to be there because he's, gonna be the king and, and he's got he's a good swordsman and he's a good ranger right. and they've got like Legolas and Gimli who are both 
powerful warriors, and you've got Boromir, who's going to be the Judas in the group. So right. They've all got reasons to. They've be all there. got purpose. They've all got a purpose, but they they're also like we can go through. Let's go through that list and let's identify the characters that we think are round characters and those we think are flat characters. Because um, I would say Legolas doesn't change a whole lot. Depending on whether you're watching the movies or talking about the books you still haven't read. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess which one I'm talking about then. <laughs> in, in the books, Legolas and Gimli both have pretty interesting plot arcs because When we get a little bit of that tension. in the movies, like they touch on yeah. it, but they don't actually unpack it, which I do actually know about their relationship yeah. in, in the books. Um, and that, um, you know... Uh, Gimli is allowed to go to the um, the Undying Lands. The Undying Lands. Thank you. I couldn't remember what it's called. Yeah, but I was going to say the Afterworld. The Afterworld uh, with the elves, which is the first time a dwarf has ever been allowed to go mm. there. But that, and that's because of the impact of their relationship. And we don't see in the movies. We don't see that unpacked. We just we see a little bit of here and there, and kind of like they're, you know, I don't really like you because you smell funny. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, you see them have an antagonistic relationship at the very yes. beginning, and then over time, it does definitely become a friendship, even in the movie. But it, in the books, it's spelled out even more, where like they become like best friends forever, and they can't stand each other at all in the beginning. Like they're at each other's throats, and so they they do have an arc. Theirs is more subtle, but they do have one. yeah. Yeah, because I'm trying now. Okay, so now I'm trying to think about what about Mary and Pippin? Do we think they're static and dynamic, or I think of glad. everybody in the story, the Hobbits, all of them have the biggest arcs in terms of their development. Like, yeah, like they all kind of begin with this naivete. Like they're basically all man children at the beginning, because that's what hobbits are. Yeah. They, they are. They're accustomed to this life of comfort and innocence, and then they're thrust into this enormous conflict that's bigger than any of them. Right. And they all, in their own unique ways, rise above that. Like, Frodo eventually becomes so corrupted by this ring that he, he like, develops, like, PTSD, basically. And right. He, he kind of... He's still a hero, but he's definitely a broken man, too. Whereas... Sam becomes the hero that he never knew he could be, where he basically saves the day and, and like finds his inner bravery. And Merry and Pippin both do that sort of thing too, where they both kind of, they choose their own path. They don't have to be a part of this, they choose to. And even when it's clear they've gotten in way over their heads, both of them still kind of rise to the challenge and become these powerful warriors who yeah they don't give away. up like there's that that one and that's one of the things that i love about the hobbits and i love about mary and pippin storylines is um that they are optional and they are optional to the to the quest but they still become so important to to the story um like you said because they opt in to be that i think that's one of the i can't watch the third movie without like i think i saw him at least half a dozen times in it <laughs> yep <laughs> but Perfectly one of the reasonable. scenes that always makes me cry is, i think it's in the third movie it's when um pippin billy boy billy boyd was pippin right mm -hmm. and he's and when he sings for the um the protector of yeah. um yeah when yeah, he, I, that scene when he, where he sings and it's such a simple scene um but it's like the end, the beginning of the end of his innocence like you can see it just like pouring out of him like that that innocent love of life that the hobbits have just kind of comes out and you can just see that it's 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 leaving and it's one of the hardest scenes it shouldn't be because it's you know it's just him singing and it's just him having dinner, but there's so much to it. It's a, it's amazing storytelling, really. Well, and, and like, if you'd had him in that position from earlier in his own personal story, like, if you plucked him right out of the Shire, put him right into Lord Denethor's hall and asked him to sing, he'd be, like, doing a little jig, dancing on the right, table, yeah. like, mm -hmm. helping himself to some of Denethor's food and, like, just having right. a good old time. But, like, over the course of what he's seen, his own growth has shown him the terrors and the horrors of this world. Yes. And he's seeing this Lord who should be helping, who should be caring oh, right, for his that, people. That's right. I was trying to remember what else is going on. So his, his son is leaving. He's leading, yeah. he's leading the charge into certain death. and that's, that's, All of his yeah. men, he's just spending yes. them on a worthless yeah. quest where they're all going to die. Yeah. And it's all Denethor's fault, and he's just completely failing. 
and then like he's this little hobbit who shouldn't have any idea what's going on in this greater world but he's like i've seen tragedies and you are failing and it it shows that he's kind of more aware than he otherwise would have been of yeah. what's wrong he knows what bravery is now he knows what true bravery is and a yeah. lot of that comes from the um the sacrifice of boromir um mm -hmm. at the end of the first movie where he watches him you know essentially sacrifice himself so the hobbits can get away and um which is you know also makes boromir around character i'll mm -hmm. think of the right names here um where you could have him he could have been a very flat character he could have not had the moment where he kind of changed and and came to and saw his sacrifice as important i think boromir is a very round character especially if you've like if you get to watch like the extended editions yeah. of movies or read the books i don't even think about any others except the extended uh, yeah. editions I anymore the, like i keep yes. forgetting there were two like <laughs> i've only watched you know since you know since i saw the theatrical versions in the theater i've only ever watched the extended yeah so yeah. i like when you can see this whole arc of like boromir again trying to gain the favor of this terrible terrible man who's just completely mm -hmm. a failure as a leader and as a father and yeah. you just realize that's what's driving him to do what he does but then at by the end he also realizes that what he's done is just as bad as what his father was doing and he sees that moment where he has the chance to be the hero and he becomes the hero so he's definitely got a huge arc so can we safely say that all the members of the fellowship are round and dynamic characters i can't think of anyone who's not yeah i can't either like i see we see um we see gimli change we see legolas change we see gandalf change um all the hobbits change um aragorn changes and boromir that's everybody, right? Yeah, they, they, and they all they all change in different ways. I mean, oh, yeah. like you've got some that come from a place of innocence that become heroes. You've got some who come from a place of hatred who learn cooperation and compassion. You've got people who come from a state of resentment who corrupt themselves and become redeemed by the end. They've all they all have arcs that kind of instead of just all having arcs that go like this. You've got some arcs that go like this. You've got some arcs that go like this. You've got some that go like this. They all go up, though. They all grow. Yeah, I think, and I think that that's one of the reasons why those stories have the power that they have, because there is so much growth, and we can see, you know, like we're talking about in the first episode when we we're talking about um, protagonists and antagonists, and we're talking about feeling that need to relate to the characters. One of the things that's great about an ensemble work like The Lord of the Rings is you have so many different characters you can relate to. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't understand um, Boromir coming from a place of privilege and security, understanding that he has to sacrifice all of that for the greater good, um, or you have I, I think to some degree, we all go through a loss of innocence, no matter who you are, and oh, yeah. break through that. So I think that that's one of the reasons why the hobbits are so relatable. Um, and, you know, we can see that with, um, oh, God, which one is the the king of the horse lands? The Theoden. Rome? Yeah, Theoden. Like, Theoden's an interesting, you know, um, arc as well, because he's, you know, so corrupted, you know, mm. by possession. Um, and then and grows out of that and then and then changes as well. So I think we can all that's one of the things that makes those arcs, regardless of what shape they take, so compelling and makes those stories enduring. And that's yeah, that's one of the reasons why we consider those stories to be such classics. It's partly because of the fantastic world building of it, but right. it's also because the characters are so deep and so like mm -hmm. well rounded and well dy dynamic over the course yeah. of the story that change and they grow and they all have elements of themselves that are conflicts that we can relate to. Like, you might not be able to completely relate to any of the characters, but you can partially relate to all of them. Right, we've exactly. we've all been in positions where we feel weak or where we feel like we're over our heads or mm -hmm. that we've been led down the wrong path or, or whatever, or we find ourselves in the wrong and don't know how to deal with it. Like, we've all got pieces of those characters in ourselves that we can relate to, which makes them feel true right. because they are.
Yeah, because we can take those pieces that work for us and, and understand and see the journey that the characters have taken. Yeah, good. Of course, it's Tolkien. How can you say it's not good storytelling? <laughs> As adapted by, you know, um, Peter Jackson, you know, <laughs> it helps to have a good person uh, working with the material, although he did have a wealth of material to work with. Uh, so to sum up, um, round and dynamic characters, we see a change throughout the story. So if you look at a story that you've, uh, that you love, think about how your character changes. Uh, flat and sta static characters are the exact opposite where they present one uh, characteristic and usually just carry that one characteristic through mm -hmm. the story. They don't just, you know, they might not appear once, they might appear several times. Um, depending on the character. I actually make an argument in my literature class for um, uh, the short story called The Necklace. and I can't remember who wrote it, um, but the main character's name is Matilda, and I always make the argument because she, she pr makes it show of changing, but her internal character never really changes. Um, so, you know, there are characters that don't change. We just definitely focused on mm -hmm. <laughs> ones that do and that being part of what's important to good storytelling. Well, so, actually, I think one example that just came to me of a yes. flat character in Lord of the Rings is Denethor. He yes. doesn't really have an arc within the story itself. Like, you, you kind of get a taste here and there, like in the, in the previews of like, of, of Denethor and Boromir and Faramir's relationship before the events of the mm -hmm. movies. Yeah. But within the movies, he remains on a stable platform and never really grows. And that's one of the reasons that he's kind of effective as an antagonist in that story, because he's not growing and he should be. Right. Like, yeah. If anybody should be changing, if anybody has a reason to change, he doesn't adapt. He doesn't adapt. He just continues to see everything in the one way he sees it. Exactly. He's ruling yeah. over this people. He should be rising to the challenge that's coming to him, but he completely fails. And like even to his at his very end, he would rather have everybody just give up and run rampant in the streets than actually take responsibility right. and lead the charge against what's coming. Mm hmm Yeah, exactly. Good. I'm glad we figured out a flat character. I knew there had to be at least one in there. I know. I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, there's got to be somebody in here that didn't really change. But it makes sense that it is a fellowship that does change and you see the growth in. Um, and we can probably make the uh, uh, arguments that some of the elves, the higher elves, don't change yeah. either. But they also are not main characters. They're sort of, you know, there for one purpose and which we'll talk about in our next installment of Good Words. <laughs> we talk about yeah. stereotype stock and side characters. So we'll, that's gonna be our next segment. Um, so let us know in the comments if there are stories that you love that have flat characters or story or characters that you hate that are round and you hate them because they change. Because that, that definitely can be a thing, too. You can definitely have a character change in a way that does not serve the story or the character. That yes, does happen exactly. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let us know if, if you have some of those characters. Uh, we'd love to hear your examples. And uh, see you next time with more good words. <laughs>